Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. <laughs> I got to the button pretty fast. That time. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Woo. Great shift in the morning, doesn't it? Let me You don't pull anything. Good morning and happy Wednesday, it is the time. It's idiotic time. Woo-hoo. Where's everybody coming from? Look at that. Yeah, the weather report's coming in. How's it looking? Mm, ah. It's smoky in Chicago today. Sorry about that, folks. That, that imported from Canada smoke going on down there, I guess. Friends from Texas, hot in Texas. Mm-hmm. It is. Yep, yep. Florida, regular old gray in the UK. Sounds like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it is good stuff, but um, yeah, well, you know, while everybody's dealing with their weather and wildfires and all the craziness of mother nature we're just gonna hang out and have a good time and who's our guest today chris who are we talking to gang we have nancy bacon with us here today nancy it is your first time with us here on idiotic so um tell our our friends and family here a little bit about yourself oh my god i am so excited to be here and that music just keeps going it keeps going <laughs> <laughs> i'm just gonna loop it in that underneath it'll be good oh my god well so i work at the intersection of adult learning and the social sector so mostly with nonprofits, but also with nonprofit state associations with uh philanthropy um government agencies really anyone who's making the world a better place and so um i'm an instructional designer i'm a teacher i'm a learning strategist and I'm really an all-around cheerleader for nonprofit staff and volunteers or really anyone who's, you know, serving serving each other and making the world better. I began in international education. So I began as an ESL teacher. I was briefly a middle school teacher. Um, I was leading cross-cultural exchange programs. And like most people, you I know a theme on this show is the accidental instructional mm-hmm. designer. Well, I was an accidental nonprofit person. Like I was... The last one standing, a, a nonprofit with no budget needed a learning director. And, you know, it was a classic nonprofit board situation. They had no money. They expected me to change the world, you know, on a dime. And I loved it. I loved it. So I ran that program for a decade. And then I started two other nonprofit learning programs. Most recently, I was at the Washington Nonprofit State Association. So most states have nonprofit state associations. And we created the curriculum that nonprofit boards are using all across the state. So, you know, it was really fun where you're mapping ecosystems and you're kind of filling gaps. And then finally, since 2020, I've been running my own business, working with clients across the country, again, all in the social sector. So all projects that are lifting up people and helping our communities thrive. Very cool. Very cool. And as you say, um, changing the world as you go. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm just so appreciative you're talking about the nonprofit sector because so often we're left out or people think they know who we are because they donate to their local, you know, food bank or whatever and keep up those donations. Um, but we're kind of a undiscovered piece of the uh, instructional design world. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, let's let's dwell a little bit on that and, and how it, how things are different compared to, say, you know, those of us who work in our uh, formal organizational learning. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me give a little bit of background on nonprofits, yeah. and, and that's going to be a circuitous way to um, to answer your question. I'm going to just share some slides here because I, I mm-hmm. think that it's really important to define terms. 
Mm-hmm. And I know you have a whole lot of folks uh, who listen to the podcast and who may be here today who are not in the United States. So to be clear, we we call them nonprofits or not for profits if you're an accounting person, but they're also called civil society organizations, NGOs. Um, I know there's probably 52 other ways to refer to folks who are making the world a better place. And there's so many different kinds. So I just want to put it out there that there's lots of different kinds of organizations that are out there and that most nonprofits, at least in the United States, are small, that there's 1.5 million organizations, not uh, 501c3s in the, in the U.S., and most of them are small. So we talk about, you know, if you look at the nonprofit sector as a market, um, the, you know, my focus is on those that are under $500,000. That's 85% of the nonprofit sector. Mm. That's that yeah. Cool? I I've never seen the chart like that before, but it, yeah, if I think about it, I mean, there's really there's really only a few like household named mm-hmm. you know nonprofits that pretty much everybody knows. So that makes sense. But um, yeah, I didn't realize how many there were sort of below the line, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh- I mean, I was talking to one person who said, you know, corporations are the same as nonprofits. Like, there's really no difference. And that could well be true if you're working for a multi-million dollar nonprofit. If you're working for Feed America or, you know, some, you know, the Red Cross or, you know, something like that. It could be just like a corporation. I have no idea. I've never worked for a corporation. So (laughs) I'm assuming (laughs) I'm making assumptions here. But once you get into, like, the vast marketplace, most nonprofits are small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, and I think the other thing that we we talked a little bit about in the green room is that nonprofits are funded mostly through soft funding. So if you think about like projects that you know, how do you run a project when really we're running off a one year grant cycle? You have to convince somebody to pay for it, you know, and and the funding piece is really. You know, we live in a scarcity mindset in the nonprofit sector, which yeah. is terrible. We're trying to counteract that. But the reality is most of the funding for these programs are coming from places that are have a one year, high, you know, uh, you know, horizon. And so often as a nonprofit instructional designer, I'm writing the grants that then pay me. That's a very mm. common system mm. that I have. Or you have something wacky like Mackenzie Scott drops a whole bunch of money on a nonprofit and then all of a sudden my phone rings. That happened <laughs> twice too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that's I the s- part that a lot of people um, miss in the in the business side of it. And it, it's interesting that it um, – obviously, it that part of the conversation of what we do bubbles up to the top. I don't know if I'm – I'm a little foggy headed this morning, so I don't know if I'm being too clear on where my head's going. But um, when we talk about corporate stuff, a lot of times I try to help people realize that a lot of the decisions that get made don't have anything to do with you and your instructional design prowess Mm -hmm. and how awesome your solution is and all of that. Right. It's there's other business things going on. And just because you have the perfect solution in mind. There could be budgeting issues. There could be internal politics going on. There, there's all of these other business things happening. And those types of things are just are very, very different in the nonprofit sector, but yet at a higher level, probably pretty much the same. But the fact that you have to manage that and at any given time, money can, like you said, can just drop and all of a sudden now they've got budget to do something and they need to go now it has to be exactly now, right so there's 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 yeah. no time for an instructional designer to go well hold on a second i have to go through all of these processes and they're like no the money is here now and if we don't use it before x uh you know it the money goes away and so it's like why are you giving me arbitrary deadlines whenever when i'm so good at what i do and it's going to take me at x y z and you know, I, I hear that all the time. It's like, you got to figure out a way to fit yourself and your work inside of those constraints. Mm, or or you get involved in those constraints. So I there see this go. question of like business development. Um, yes, absolutely. That I am, I am getting all the notifications of state contracts and all of that. And I'm often writing proposals that I then build. But But further to your point, I have never experienced 
working on just the instructional design portion of a project that in just the last year, I've been working on an instructional design process and the executive director either gets fired or there's a significant reorg. And then the board chair is calling me or texting me. And then all of a sudden I'm doing a board training and I'm facilitating, like talk about wearing multiple hats because I have both the instructional design and the educator hat and I have you know, the nonprofit hat, I'm constantly both kind of providing counseling as well as moving the project forward, which I love. I mean, some people, I, I have a colleague who will never work for a nonprofit because of the drama. And there is a high level of drama in nonprofits I've experienced often because there is dispersed accountability. Like who's in charge? You have a board of directors that all have day jobs. So they share accountability for an organization. And then you have an underfunded, often staff. And so you have this dispersed accountability that makes it all a little bit difficult mm. or, or opportunities for organizational development. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to speculate too. that there's often, um, you know, a lot of passion because people, you know, put their heart and their time into a place, you know, an organization, uh, a project, you know, that really, you know, does speak to them as well. So, um, I'm going to bet, bet that there's also a lot of um, like that emotional level of, of connection to the work that is maybe a lot different sometimes than than working in an organization where you might love your work, but you you know it's not the same. I didn't say emotional connection maybe. Yeah, no, I I think so, and I mean I can share. So here is you know the framework that I use in terms of let's see how do I progress my slides now. There we go. So this is the framework that I think a lot about. And if you're listening to this and you're not seeing the slides, it's really a set of concentric circles. And as I think about, you know, our conversation today is navigating the nonprofit ecosystem. And so I think it's important to think about what is the nonprofit ecosystem and what is our, you know, theory for change if we want to get wonky. <laughs> and the theory of change that I've long used is that strong nonprofit who are connected to each other, who are focused on what really matters in our community can change the world. And so as we think about, and at the center of that, of course, is research-based, outcome-based learning, which so often is called performance-based learning, but nonprofit folks think in terms of outputs and outcomes. So outcome is what makes sense in the nonprofit sector. But if you think about strong nonprofits who have strong boards, their financial literacy is high, they know compliance rules, they know how to raise money, that are connected to each other. So they're collaborating, they're working together, they have relationships, they're sustaining each other, but then you focus them on hunger or homelessness or safeguarding or, or you know, early childhood education. That's how we make the world a better place. And, and as I was thinking about today's conversation, I was like lining that up to exactly the projects that I work on in, in terms of, of strong nonprofits, how do we train boards and finance and all that connected to each other? So we have conferences and networks and community based learning. And then mo the bulk of my instructional design is around like, how do we strengthen safeguarding practices that, you know, the opposite of safeguarding is human trafficking. Like, how do we prevent human trafficking? And so that's the framework that I like to share with people. Wow, there's a there's a lot to dig into. Uh, there for sure. And it, I think it's when we, um, one buzzword you kind of touched on was that performance, you know, looking for the performance and the outcomes. And I, I'm certain there were a few people in the chat that were like, Hey, I'm in corporate and we, we think performance is important too. <laughs> mm, absolutely. <laughs> you know? And out and outcomes, we we're into outcomes too. I don't understand why that's so, you know, unique to, the nonprofit, but I think it's just, I think it's unique in a different way. It is unique in a different way. And the way I think about it, and 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 surely I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm not an authority on corporate learning, so I can't say if it's there or not. But one of the things that I, I think may be unique in the nonprofit setting is that we're talking about open-ended content, like leadership and, you know, all this, you know, where there's, where good is not necessarily defined. And we're we're talking about an open ended context. So I often attend, you know, L and D events that are mostly, you know, attendees mostly come out of corporations. And one of the things I notice, and I love this idea, is that kind of closed loop 
that notion, I think of Emma Weber and learning transfer and all of this notion of you have, you know, whatever you teach, you have that accountability piece through the supervisor, or there's some accountability loop that ensures whatever you've taught or whatever training program has been attended kind of feeds back into the performance of the company. We often work in, in, in a, there is no accountability loop. So I show up in Wenatchee, Washington to lead a board training and every board is different. They have all of their own issues and, and opportunities. And then I have absolutely no accountability. Like I, I, I can't like force them to do what I tell them to do. They go forth into their community and, and hopefully they implement something, something I taught them. Right. So open ended content and open ended context just kind of makes this whole thing feel a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. that's that to me kind of sums it all up really at, the, at a high level. That is a, a really big, big difference because you're right. There's always some sort of accountability loop in the corporate side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we, you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, training, um, you know, board members, et cetera. What, so what kind of things, you know, content wise or, or et cetera, does that often include? That's something that, um, I'd love to know a bit more about. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of board training is happening now, particularly since coming out of COVID board stopped meeting and just by way of kind of, so let me just throw this out to the audience. Like what are the, what are the cause, what are the nonprofits that you know about? So use the chat box and, and Chris and Brent, what are the nonprofits mm -hmm. that you think about when you think about a nonprofit? Mm. Well, the, you know, yeah, the, the, like Brent mentioned, there's always some big names that, that it, you could come up with. Um, immediately. Um, I've worked with, um, done volunteer work with the Canadian Cancer Society in the past, um, mm -hmm. as well as uh, our own here in Canada, the Canadian version of ATD, which used to be called the CSTD, and is yeah. now the I4PL. Um, yeah. You know, local boards on that, uh, local um, community groups on that front. Yeah, yeah. So then you think about those organizations. I see Marnie typed in United Way, Red Cross, Save the Children, and you know, often food banks come into play. Who are governing those organizations? Mm. Right? You think about who are the the you know the governance structure is the board, and so they go out and they recruit a bunch of people who are hopefully connected uh to the to the cause. That's the hope. How do they know what to do? Right? They don't. Yeah. And so, and, and so oftentimes they think they do, or they take whatever knowledge they have from the corporate world and they apply it to a nonprofit. And usually that, that goes a little slanted, you know, it can. And so when we're doing board training, we start with purposeful leadership. You're here because you love that cause. You're here because, you know, I think of Danielle, charity water. We want to make sure everyone has access to fresh water. And so I joined the board because I'm passionate about clean water and drinking water and access. But I, I then need to know how, you know, what my roles and responsibilities are. I find often people don't have basic financial literacy on how to read a balance sheet, how to read an income statement, how to look at cash flow, things like that. There's compliance issues. And then, of course, every nonprofit needs to raise money. I love teaching about fundraising because then you're really unleashing the passion they have with the network they have in order to raise money. So, so that's a typical board training. Mm. Um, and, and of course, you know, I was really struck when I was, you know, early on in my career, this notion that people learn in three places alone in peer groups and in classrooms. And so thinking a lot about boards, I think, okay, these are busy people. They have lives, they have families, they have jobs. How do we maximize learning when they're alone, when they're in their peer group, which is the board. And then how do we run trainings in classrooms? Very I cool. like that. That's such a great way to simplify what I think. A lot of our colleagues in L and D have complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it's easy to complicate. Like if you have capture a captured audience, like you have a bunch of employees who are sitting in your office building, I think it's easy to get kind of sloppy in that. And I do think one of the nuggets in the nonprofit space is that we have to be good in the sense that how do I get anyone to come to a training? How do I get anyone to do anything yeah. I've taught them? I have no stick. I have only carrot. And so that's where the more we can think about, you know, 
maximizing every moment of time and every resource we have, the more we're going to have stronger nonprofits, stronger communities, and a better world. That's getting really melodramatic. Well, I'll say <laughs> it. <laughs> no, but it's spot on. I mean, it is, uh, it, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's exactly what was kind of going through my head, which is what makes the nonprofit sector, the social sector. I like that phrasing too, by the way. I like just because that does cover a large swath mm -hmm. of, of that, that, that business sector globally, right? Using that phrase. And it's, um, you know, how, so, so there's the board that you have to deal with. And then there's the volunteers, that, that, <laughs> that, that dreadful word, those people who don't have any power and authority on a board, but yet they're really super gung ho and they decide one day that they want to be a volunteer. And, but then they realize that it actually takes commitment. And to your point, mm. getting those folks trained and educated on what your expectations mm -hmm. of them are can also be an extreme challenge. How do you wrestle that one? Oh, well, the first thing is you realize that volunteers are the nonprofit superpower. Only nonprofits are allowed to have volunteers. For-profit businesses are not allowed to have volunteers. It violates wage law. That See my law class for that. But, <laughs> but nonprofits have a superpower, and that's their volunteers. And what we need to do as instructional designers and people who are supporting the sector is support nonprofits to educate their volunteers and to help them really thrive. And so, for example, I work with the, the Washington State, um, the, the Association of Food Banks, so Washington Food Coalition. And we have, I mean, this gets to the social sector idea that we have a government grant through LNI to fund safety and health training with, for the food banks of Washington. And so we've been, one of our fun projects recently is we've been building out flip cards. So you go in and you volunteer and we want to make sure you don't throw out your back. We don't want to put the burden of like the whole training on the nonprofit staff. They're busy. They don't have time. You show up and I don't have time to teach you how not to throw out your back when you lift a heavy box. So we've been building out these flip cards so that you show up. I give you the flip card. You read the flip card. You click on the QR code. You get a two minute video on how to properly lift a box. And they're, they're a great example of how instructional design can support our nonprofits to do what they need to do. So they're not wasting time. They're not wasting, you know, money to L and I, and the world is a better place. Mm -hmm. Did I sound like, that sounds <laughs> like you gotta be, it's, well, here's what it sounds like to me. That's a, that's a good, that's a great um, example of the constraint that you work in forces you to do better instructional design. Mm -hmm. My, my point being it, you're, we always talk about in the corporate space, you know, you, you know, this, this two hour course could have been a job aid, right? Uh -huh. in, in your environment, it's like out of necessity and context, exactly. it has to be a job aid because that's all you can do. Right? right. I can't get all these volunteers to come to a two hour training. Like that's just not going to happen. But we can basically assume that all these volunteers have a, a smartphone and they can click a QR code and they've got the two minute video. So we did a similar thing. It was super fun working with Hunger Free Oklahoma with the um, how do we get more people to have access to SNAP benefits? And, you know, we're rolling out SNAP benefits across Oklahoma. I mean, well, they have SNAP benefits, but we're rolling out a program to what, what, what are what are SNAP benefits? Sorry, just give us a little context there. Yeah. So SNAP benefits and this is a U.S. thing, but they used to be called uh, food stamps. They're now kind of all digitally online. So it's there's no more like little little what do they call little vouchers or whatever. Um, <laughs> And so this notion of how do folks who are who are hungry have access to food? And one of the programs, you know, and, and all the frontline folks who are who are intersecting with people who may be hungry, those are like librarians or food bank workers or school counselors. Or in one case, we had um, farmer market vendors. And farmer market vendors, there's a, you know, kind of a two for one thing if you buy fresh vegetables at the farmer's market. And so how do we educate farmer market vendors to understand SNAP enough so that they can help the person who's coming to them with SNAP benefits? And so, again, we used a whole system of a one pager and a QR code and, and put it into multiple languages 
so that we can make sure, you know, farmer vendors, farmer market vendors have like their their intersection with SNAP is like 0.0001% of their work life. So how do we give them just what they need to know, like at the farmer market right before the market opens? And so it's a similar, similar strategy. Hmm. Yeah. Sarah's dropped a, a couple of uh, really, um, I think, fascinating points in the in the chat. One of them just, you know, what you were speaking of, the volunteers time is such a valuable commodity too, and you don't want to waste it. It's important. Everyone needs knows everything they need to know, but you don't want to take any longer than you have to because then you're taking their time away from the cause you want them to be supporting. So um, they're there to, to make a difference. But if the, the barrier to entry is is yeah. a um, is a certificate program, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, I can go somewhere else with my time then. Right, right. Yeah, it's a classic case of just enough information. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all they need. Yeah. Yeah, and then so they've got, so we've kind of touched on the boards and we've touched on volunteers. Is it different with actual staff? Like, how does how does that do you do you take a different approach with the actual? I mean, if they have any quote unquote paid staff, is that does that then become more corporate ish? So, I mean, again, there's a big span of size for nonprofits, but you know, if we're talking about smaller organizations, I think there is a real. What I have found is. And again, not not having ever attended a corporate training, I'm not comparing, but I feel like there's a real ethos of of love and caring in a nonprofit training involving staff. Because we realize, particularly at the small small organization level, that they've got a lot going on. They're wearing a lot of hats, and so yeah. they, um, I think, understanding their their kind of accountability system and the fact that they're juggling grants and they're juggling you know, board. And I mean, so often I work with a whole bunch of associations where, you know, I essentially become the outsourced CLO simply because, you know, you have a one or two people staff and they need someone to walk alongside them as they're implementing stuff. But as we're training staff, so if we flip that on in terms of instructional design for staff, I th I do think it then becomes you know, much more typical of what we see in the larger kind of training market. Although there is a real move now to put learning online and to make, you know, I think COVID did did some service around understanding that we don't all have to come together into a into a workshop or a webinar. We don't have to, um, you know, attend a conference in order to get learning that we can we can put learning where it needs to go. I do think that there's some, you know, I don't know how the market works in the corporate setting, but so one thing we're finding, for example, is coming out of COVID, there's a huge need for supervisor training. And I'm thinking a lot about what are the, what are the market systems that will drive that to be created? Um, so many people have either left the nonprofit sector, they left their job or they're, you know, there's just a huge turn, turnover in staff. So there's a need for a supervisor training, and that's something we've been building out and thinking about. But at the same time, just from a, you know, I was an economics major as a as an undergrad, and I think a lot about what are the market forces that would cause the creation of a supervisor training. And I think the nonprofit sector is always about one or two steps behind, simply because there's not a lot of money to be made in our sector. There's a lot of love to be had, but not a lot of money. <laughs> You know, I was I was just thinking uh, when when you asked the question, my my brain was still working on the question you asked a while back about what nonprofits you know do you do you yeah. work with or do you know of and whatnot. And of course, ATD came to mind right off the bat as far as a, a nonprofit in our sector. If if folks want to kind of um, under you know be thinking about what a what a nonprofit or a social sector business is, but the, another one that came to mind, and I'm curious, maybe somebody can Google this for me and see if it still exists. But when I was working at the e-learning guild, David Holcomb, the founder of the e-learning guild sat on the board of an, a nonprofit that was e-learning based. It was like a, it was an e-learning for nonprofits. It had an, it had an acronym, and I'd, I'd know it if somebody mentioned it to me, but I don't even know that it exists anymore. But basically what it was there to do was to pull together um, vendors and their, and, their, um, and their technology 
and the instructional design e-learning developer community and to have them work together on projects for you know free on a voluntary basis for those large you know or small nonprofits that couldn't afford it themselves and so it would look good on your resume you know all that kind mm. of stuff it made the vendors look good if you got you know if you if you offered up your you know your deck to uh to a you know a, a company in need for example and all that kind of stuff it just I can't remember the name of it, but I, I know it's out there. I remember us at DevLearn and whatnot, um, uh, always having at least one slide that I would go through and talk about and tell people to volunteer their time and, um, and, and to go work with that. But I don't, I don't know if anybody uh, remembers that or not, but, I, but we do have one. We have an e-learning tech-ish style community out there. <laughs> I know yeah. it's there. And like I said, maybe it's gone now. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, yeah. And if there's, I, so maybe there's a gap. Maybe there's that's something we can all try to put back together. I don't know. In the chat, Marty was mentioning, you know, a bit more broadly that the, I think the management of institutional knowledge is an important training consideration, too, since nonprofits experience so much turnover, um, including the supervisor turnover that, uh, that you were just you know, referring to, Nancy. Yeah, and I talk a lot with with you know pretty much anyone I ever work with to the point where they're all like Nancy's going to say this again, <laughs> learning strategy, and that a lot. This is, I mean, I find adult learning generally, and even the business side of building out a learning strategy is 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 a foreign concept to many nonprofits. Right? They they get founded in order to save the puppies or to you know. <laughs> Um, provide health and human services or hospice care or food bank or domestic violence, like all of that. When I deliver a training, there's that smattering of the community in the room. They're there for that. And they're not necessarily thinking about their larger learning strategy. And to Marty's point, this notion of, you know, managing the institutional knowledge, that to me would all really funnel into a, a learning strategy. Recently, I was working with a client and I was, you know, they were kind of working on really the tactical stuff, you know, building out slide decks and trainings and all of this. And it kept funneling into like, so what are we going to do with this? And what are we going to do with this? And I was almost begging them to have a learning strategy. And finally, I had them send me their strategic plan because I'm like, okay, let's, let's go to the top. Let's go like, if you're talking about, you know, performance and outcomes and business goals and, and all of that, let's go to your strategic plan and what you're trying to achieve. And lo and behold, every single section of the strategic plan related to learning, like <laughs> either either teaching people new content or convincing, you know, policymakers to change how they engage in something like every single aspect of the strategic plan had to do with learning. And yet I still couldn't persevere on having a learning strategy. So these are these are some of the things that, you know, are just interesting in the social sector. <laughs> how do you have a strategy? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I think, too, I mean, it's like anything else. I think for, for in the corporate space, when the when a company is small or like when it's considered startup, right, the, the real thing is getting money, getting it's, you know, the, the same, but you're getting venture capital money or or whatever. And you're just trying to build and you're trying to grow in the nonprofit world. It's how do we get our funding? How do we get, you know, how do we go out? And everyone's mostly concerned about that, doing the thing that they love and getting that done. But then how do we fund it? And then, and then, oh yeah, how do we train the people that are going to be doing that work that we need them to do kind of is on the back burner until they all of a sudden really need it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, I think... It, yeah, to that point, I think it's interesting how many associations and others who have learning central to everything they do are there. They haven't invested in somebody who's expert in learning. Um, and I think that that's a real opportunity we have for the sector. And as folks on the call or who listen later um, think about how they can support the nonprofit sector, I think bringing uh, your expertise and your passion for learning and research based Kind of learning programs is a real gift that could could support the nonprofit social sector. You know, you mentioned I'll, I'll say when we were kind of chatting in the green room, you, we were joking about how nonprofits are very low tech or no tech. But um, it, being an old guy, you mentioned QR codes. It wasn't that long ago that had I pitched <laughs> QR codes to a nonprofit. 
they would have looked at me funny and said, what? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know? we're all over QR codes now. <laughs> <laughs> is talking about the lack of learning and development and that is absolutely true that you know i've worked for organizations where you know i have a 200 dollars a year you know conference budget and you know tell me what i can do where i can go for 200 dollars. i mean you mentioned devlearn and a colleague in dc mentioned he was going to devlearn and i'm like i can't go to devlearn for 200 dollars <laughs> So like, we're just not playing. Nope. We're, I mean, just like this is the first kind of nonprofit focused podcast I've heard. Um, there's, there's just, we don't play in the learning and development space because we don't have money to. And that is a real, that makes me sad. And I, I would love to kind of figure out a way to shift that over time. I would, I would venture to say, I mean, obviously with travel and everything, the 200 bucks can probably get you up the street. Uh, so, you know, that's going to be the toughest part, but I, I would bet if you talked to, you know, just sent an email or talked to somebody, I, I know the guild offers nonprofit discounts, mm. but I think if you really wanted to be there and you really, you know, and this is for everybody, not just, not just you, it's, it's, I think for everybody, I think just reaching out to people, everybody has a soft spot for helping out the nonprofits <laughs> and I, you know, I think just talking to folks and getting to know folks a little bit can uh, can help with that. But yeah, two hundred bucks. I mean, shoot, maybe yeah. buy yourself a couple books or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think on the flip side, one of the things that I've been kind of making my life's work recently is really to be evangelical about nonprofits and associations in particular, really investing that if you're going to be yeah. centering your work in learning and development, then you you need to be investing in this work and, and give me access to any board member, any any funder. And I'd love to have the conversation about mm -hmm. why excellence in learning is part of your bottom line. It will save the puppies and it will help in hospice and and all of the, you know, incredible work that nonprofit folks are doing. Yeah, it's, um, so I guess one of the things that, that I've seen done in corporate, and maybe this would work for nonprofit too, but is there ever a sense of applying or trying to convince someone that there needs to be some budget for the learning and training? Um, and, and maybe there's some laws that protect nonprofits against it, but is it like the box lifting thing, right? Like, are you responsible for the volunteer if somebody lifts a box wrong? So is there like a, is there a compliance thing that you like, that you need to tell the board, listen, if somebody comes and volunteers and we don't train them to do this correctly, they could throw their back out and now we're liable. And that means you, the board has to figure out how to raise more money to pay off the lawsuit that's coming. It, uh, or, that, or, are you, or are you guys protected somehow? Are you guys? No, we guys are not protected. We guys uh, <laughs> have to follow all of the laws that you guys have to follow. And so this is part of our law training, of course, that a lot of nonprofits think, well, I'm, I'm making the world a better place. Maybe they have their 501c3, which means they're tax exempt at a federal level. And so all of a sudden they think I don't have to pay any taxes. I don't have to follow any state laws. And I, I've met with nonprofits who think that. And, you know, I, I think there's just some education there that, you know, a nonprofit is born at the state level and all state laws apply. So all of the LNI laws, all of the liquor, I mean, talk about, so I wrote the liquor law guide for Washington state. That was one of my funnest projects because <laughs> liquor law in Washington state. So I was also a German literature undergraduate and Kafka was my favorite author. And there's nothing more Kafka-esque than liquor law in Washington state, right? First you jump on your right foot, then your left foot. But if they catch you on your right foot, then you raise your left hand and then you do the hokey pokey. Like that's liquor law in Washington state. So <laughs> we we wrote the guide on the whole thing. And so many, so many nonprofits were saying, but I'm raising money for domestic violence. So this doesn't apply to me. And it does. And this is this is the thing that, you know, we need to, you know, that's a, a, a training opportunity, of course, to make sure folks understand that the laws do apply and um, state and federal are different jurisdictions. And, you know, this is all the fun of nonprofit law. 
<laughs> so that, so that the board member can't just show up with a, a case of beer and host a, a party at an event? <laughs> no, not if the public is involved. Nope. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> Well, that's, that's uh, good to know. I'll have to cancel that uh, yeah. nonprofit meeting I had scheduled <laughs> for this week. <laughs> well, and then when cannabis became legal, everybody thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have like, you know, either cannabis. It, it didn't come into cannabis at the event so much as cannabis available through like the silent auction or the live auction. And oh, oh my God. Yeah. So the Liquor Control Board changed their name to the Liquor Cannabis Board. So LCB still remains. And that was another whole learning process around Nonprofits uh, should not get anywhere near cannabis because it's um, uh, not federally legal. There's your lesson for the day. <laughs> that if that's not one I would have thought of, but to, I, I we've done, we've hosted, and we've participated in a boatload of um, auctions of yeah, you know, with all the all the stuff as our our kids were growing up. We were oh my gosh, I can't even count how many uh, we've we've helped with, but yeah, it never, it never dawned on me to even think about that kind of stuff. Cause I think there were packages that included liquor. I think there was a lot of liquor, yeah. liquor baskets and stuff that yeah. went, you know, a couple tickets yeah. to a basketball game and a bottle of whiskey and some, <laughs> some fancy glasses and a bat and a fancy basket, you know, gets auctioned off for a few hundred bucks. Yeah. But so these are to go back to like the learning ecosystem and to understand kind of where the opportunities and where it gets exciting is like, how do we create learning that fits for the volunteer board fundraising committee person who doesn't understand liquor law? Like these are wonderful creative opportunities to make sure they have the information they need so they don't get their organization shut down. Because I've I've seen I've heard about fundraisers shut down like the week before the fundraiser because they didn't get the right liquor permit. Uh, you know, we don't want that to happen. So we want yeah. our nonprofits to raise the money they need to raise so that they thrive. It's we awesome. want our nonprofits to raise the money and be officially allowed to also raise their glasses. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. With all the paperwork in place. Touche. Yeah. With, with pinky fully extended. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Nancy, this has been so fantastic to have you here talking about this. If um, let's do a call out to everybody, and um, you know, if they could reach out to you, or if there was one, some parting words you can offer to folks if they decide, you know, what I want to offer up my e-learning skills or my ID skills. How can they do that or or what just in general, what's what are the, what's the best bit of advice we can throw out to folks? Hey, well, so I put my contact information in the chat box and I would say the first thing to do is go find a take your cause, whatever you love and go get involved with that nonprofit, like go mm. sit on the board, become a volunteer and get to know them. And then I bet you 50 bucks they have some sort of a training. They need a volunteer training or they need a, I don't know, board training. They need really anything. And reach out to me. I, I probably have a whole library of all these things because I've been doing this mm -hmm. for so long. But, you know, the first, the first thing with nonprofits is to find a cause you love. So start mm -hmm. there and get involved. Yeah. Nancy, is that 50 bucks bet, is that tax deductible or <laughs> I get it? Can I get a, uh, a receipt you for that? You cannot get a receipt. <laughs> you know, technically, if I were a nonprofit, you wouldn't need a receipt because it's under the two hundred fifty dollars threshold. But <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There we go. Learning still. <laughs> yes. At the end of our time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a really cool uh, glimpse into that world. I mean, so much of what we talk about here obviously is focused on organizational learning in the profitable or the, the theoretically profitable section of the world um and it's been a fabulous for you to bring this uh, this other perspective forward here for us on instructional designers in offices drinking coffee folks the work that we get to do here uh, on instructional designers in offices drinking coffee is sponsored by domino learning systems makers of domino one and i'm going to just throw in a little link in the chat perhaps there are some things that you can check out Maybe we can help you and your organization do some things. Do them better. Fill that in. Gang, as always, thanks so much for the great chat, too. Lots of
some great um, assistive thoughts going on in there too. Indeed, uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you all. I'm just so grateful. Nancy, thank you so much. Folks, if you haven't already, you can also join our LinkedIn group. Right? Let's dance on out. See you all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you all.